What's up, everyone? Welcome to the last podcast of 2016. Now, before we get this party started, I'd like this mapacho. I want to encourage everybody who likes the show, please go to iTunes and leave a review. That'll help get this podcast out to as many people as possible. Para el bien de todos, for the good of all. Now, let's get this party started. Now, as I like this mapacho, as you notice, the title of this podcast is to make 2017 your bitch. And I want to remind everybody that no actual bitches were harmed or humans were called bitches in the naming of this podcast. It's a metaphor, people. Relax. (laughs) What it means is we're going to go out there and we're going to crush 2017 with a couple concepts that I'm personally working on in my own mind. And so generally, um, if it's something that I'm working on, it's something that a lot of you guys are working on as well. So uh, we're going to talk about the three biggest points um, that I have in my mind for going out and killing it in 2017. So I'm going to light this mapacho. You guys get some beverages. I like to have at least three beverages per podcast, but if you have less than three, you know, that's acceptable. We'll be all right. Um, but I'm going to light this thing up and, uh, and we'll get this party started. All right. I like it. So the first thing, there's a reason why I chose three things for us to focus on for 2017. And that is that I really believe that we can only focus on three things at a time. And this is some advice from some of the top business mentors that I have to cut down the amount of things that you're trying to go for to three things, you know, and that seems to be the magic number. I think one of the things that happens is you get these long lists of things to do, all of these areas of your life, you want to improve everything that you want to happen. And you get this kind of paralysis by analysis. It's such a broad spectrum of things that you're trying to accomplish that you end up accomplishing none of them because it's just overwhelming. Cortisol spikes and you just sit there, you know, shivering in a pile of your your own anticipation and not actually accomplishing shit. So I think for me, really focusing on three things is gonna be key. Um, And, you know, I know you might be tempted to play crafty and say focusing on three things is one of the three things. Maybe, I get it. But (laughs) we're gonna talk about three other things um, to focus on for 2017. And as I said, these are all things that were born from my own suffering. And that's generally how I learn. I learn because, you know, I struggle with something, I fail at something. And then because of that, I have to adapt. And in the adaptation in both mind, body, spirit, however, the adaptation comes, then I'm able to learn something. And when I learn something, I'm going to come out and share it with you guys. And not that any of this stuff is brand new material, but it's just maybe a slight the different emphasis I put on it or a slightly different way of thinking about it. Now, we'll jump right into it. The first one is one of the absolute most important things that I can ever remember. And that is the concept of being the observer to your own life, right? So many times we get caught up in in the emotions that we're feeling, in the thoughts that we're having, that we're unable to access our consciousness, that ability to be the observer of what's going on. And so we forfeit our ability to actually maneuver and change it. I mean, think about a time when you're incredibly angry. You know, you become that anger. Your thoughts are are manipulated and are created based upon the anger that you're feeling. You are rage embodied, right? And so when you're rage embodied and all your thoughts are justifying it and everything is lining up, you know, to kind of support that emotional wave, then there's no chance for you to step aside for you to, you know, take the surfboard and hop on a different wave, because you are that emotion, you are inseparable from that thing. However, you know, if you change your point of identification to a point of consciousness to the observer, then you can look at yourself and say, Hey, look, there's the Aubrey, he's really pissed off right now. Look what happens when he gets pissed off. His thoughts turn really dark, his knuckles get full of blood and his pulse is elevated and he just wants to destroy. (laughs) Not that that's necessarily what happens when you're angry, but you know, you get the idea like, and if you can be the observer and just have that kind of passive, calm observation of what's going on, like, hey, look at the Aubrey being angry right now. Look at the Aubrey being sad right now. Look at the Aubrey, you know, being anxious right now, being stressed. All of a sudden, like by becoming the observer, you're accessing your consciousness. And your consciousness is anchored to the present moment and it's still, you know, it doesn't bob up and down in the turbulence of the sea 
like all of the other factors. So being the observer is key. I think, you know, Sam Harris talks about, you know, being the being the thinker behind the thoughts. You know, so many great mystics talk about it, being the witness, um, being the witness to to all of the things going on in the human animal. So there's three kind of elements of observation. And I think the first element is to observe the monkey itself, you know, this body that we have, this animal. And, oh man, my papacho went out. And that's been, you know, one of the main messages of on it. That's why we put, you know, all of the chimps on, on all of our shirts and the chimp kettlebells. It's, it's a reminder that underneath all of the thoughts in the mind and this personhood, this selfhood is a human animal. And that human animal is kind of a savage. I mean, really, he's developed through years and evolution of savagery, as well as an evolution of consciousness and kindness and compassion and working together. But, but savage tribalism and savage needs for sex and appetites and all of these things. And I think acknowledging the true nature of, our, uh, of the animal that we are is absolutely essential. So... If you're able to observe the monkey, I think you can develop a different relationship with the body. I think sometimes we really develop an antagonistic relationship with the animal that we live inside. And that starts with a lot of negative self-talk. I mean, we pretty much talk to the animal about all of the things that we don't like about it. If it's in pain, you know, we say, ah, oh, stupid thing, my stupid hip is in pain, my stupid fucking knee is in pain. Not really thinking like, okay, hip, okay, knee. You know, here I am, the ruler of this body, and what can I do to help you out? Clearly, you're sending me a signal that something's wrong. How can I help you? You know, or if your st- you know, stomach hurts and something's off, instead of you be like, oh, man, my stupid stomach, is, it hurts. You know, instead of like, okay, stomach, I hear you. I hear you clamoring for some attention. You know, what can I do to help you out? And this can be from something specific like knee pain or something absolutely general, like, you know, fatigue or like um, any kind of general mood issue that you might be having or something that's going on that feels based in the body. Like observe that and be kind and and try to work with the body. And another way that we have horrible self-talk is with the appearance. Like we're a little bit overweight and you're like, oh, you fat piece of shit. You know, look how overweight you are. You know, that's no way, like, we would never treat any other person the same way that we treat our body. We would never say that to anybody else. But since it's us, we just let it fly. We just let it rip. You know, we give ourselves hell, you know. And if we look a little unattractive or we get a pimple or we blah, 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 it's this cascade of negative self-talk which creates this antagonistic relationship with the body. You know, and then you look at something like, Dr. Joe Dispenza's You Are the Placebo, talking about using the mind and using belief to support the body in positive ways. And if we have this super antagonistic relationship with the body, we got a lot of work to be done. You know, if we're trying to develop positive communication to yield the best outcome, and all we're doing is telling our body that it's a piece of shit, you know, then that's a tough place to start, just like with any relationship, just like if you're trying to manage a marriage. You know, and I think really Don Miguel makes this great analogy, this great metaphors, calling us the ruler of our trillions of cells. Like there are loyal subjects working day and night tirelessly to support us, support all of our ambitions, our needs, our movements, our anything that we want from the body. They're constantly working to yield the best outcome. You know, so what kind of ruler are we? Are we going to be giving it the right food, the right nutrition, or are we going to just be jamming it with intoxicants and escaping from the signs and signals and the communication that it's saying like, ah, shut the fuck up, body. I'm going to give you some more Valiums, you know, give you some more, you know, more fucking Johnny Walker red. That'll, that'll do you. That'll shut you up. You stupid fucking body. You know, is that the relationship we're going to be? Is that the kind of ruler we're going to be? Are we going to be a tyrant or a despot? Are we going to be a kind ruler that's working with the body and, and trying to figure out solutions together? And, and that's, I think, you know, what can happen when you become the observer of the body. Absolutely one of the most crucial things. And it's really easy to get down on the body. You know, I, have, I didn't start on it because I have naturally great health. You know, it wasn't like, oh, I have such great health. I need to come, make a company and, and show off what great health I have. No, I made on it 
partly in response to kind of shitty health. You know, my immune system kind of sucks. And this is from a lot of reasons, you know, all the way from the start of C-section birth to, you know, regular doses of antibiotics to try and cure some strep throat that killed all my friendly probiotic bacteria. And, and which is a key in like the anchor of the immune system comes in the gut. And I've had my gut checked and I'm working on it. And there's all these different other factors that have created and, and fuck, I go hard. You know, I both party and work out hard. I've done everything possible, <laughs> negative and positive to this body. And, and I think that's one of the impetuses to, to create, you know, a health company is to provide the tools for myself and provide the tools, you know, necessary to, uh, to yield the best, you know, the best possible outcome, you know? So getting that self-talk in alignment is absolutely, absolutely essential. I think, um, you know, and, and thinking about like good examples of self-talk, you know, and where I was actually going with the original point is like, you know, when I'm sick all the time, that's when I get the hardest on myself. You know, that's when I get like, oh man, I have a piece of shit immune system. It's not work. I'm sick again. Oh man, you know, I'm doing everything right. Stupid body's not listening. You know, whereas in the other, in the other form of self-talk, look at like, the fighter Briggs, who is on uh, on Rogan's podcast, who's constantly telling himself, let's go champ, you know? And there's no doubt in my mind, because I've experienced it, when I'm sick and I start telling my body like, all right, body, we got a challenge right now. Let's go champ, let's go champ. You know, let's make it happen. Let's figure something out. Let's go body, you got this. All of a sudden, instantly I feel more well, I start feeling better and I recover faster. And it's not, it's not a miracle, you know, it's all wrapped into the placebo and the nocebo effect which is accounted for in every single clinical trial. This is not woo-woo stuff. The placebo effect is real. And what is the placebo effect? That is utilizing the mind to influence the body. What is the nocebo effect? It's utilizing the mind to create a negative outcome for the body, you know? That's real, it's irrefutable. The mind has an influence on the body, period. You know, and we can either use it beneficially or we can use it antagonistically. And I think all too often we use it antagonistically. And, and part of that reason is not being the observer. And when we separate as the observer, we can be the kind and gentle ruler that our body needs. Now, of course, as I mentioned before, observing the emotions and the ego. You know, this is going to be another huge one. And the ego is really hard to observe because the ego's favorite game and its favorite delusion is to tell us that it's self. The ego loves to pretend itself. It's almost like in a fight for survival, a fight for selfhood. And it wants to exist, but it's not real. It's an apparition of the mind. It's not our consciousness, that eternal force of life that's animating our body, that, you know, that, that spark that will continue and carry on past this life. Now, do I know that it carries on past this life? No, I don't. But that's what I've experienced in all of my travels and all of my meditation and psychedelic experiences. So I believe it. And that's what I'm talking about. It's not any dogma or doctrine that I'm coming from, but it's just my own personal experience. So it's not that consciousness that extends beyond life. You know, it's an apparition created combining, you know, the body and the mind. And it's a mechanism that we've used to play to certain advantages, but it can also play to a lot, a lot of suffering. And a good way to identify the ego is the ego is constantly vulnerable. The ego is constantly jockeying for position. It's constantly measuring itself against other people. It's constantly saying, how dare you? That's the favorite thing the ego says, you know? When your girlfriend says something or your boyfriend says something to upset you, you know, instantly the ego, you know, bristles its hairy back its little troll self and goes, how dare you? How dare you do this to me? Say this to me. And in that moment, if we can separate and become consciousness, anchor to the present moment and look at it and say, oh, look, you know, the ego is upset right now. It's okay, ego. We're good. Everything's going to be fine. You're going to be fine. No worries. And it's not about slaying the ego or killing the ego. It's not even possible. It's just about observing the ego and sending it some love. You know, the ego can be useful. It's a source of fuel. It's a source of motivation. It's fun, you know, but like the Toltecs say, play the ego as your controlled folly. Play that as something that you know it's a game. These games are the ego. Think of Conor McGregor driving his Bentley down the road and just laughing and smiling, you know, 
think about that with his shiny belts. You know, play that game of the ego, but play it as a game. Don't play it as life or death because it's not life or death. You know, the ego is not real. It's just an apparition of the body and mind. So observe that and be aware of it and then just laugh and, and don't take it so seriously. You know, if the ego gets bristled, be like, oh man, look at the ego getting all fired up. And that'll save you a lot of suffering because if you identify as the ego, then the ego is going to tell you everything's life or death. Then your cortisol levels are going to get jacked and then you're looking around like everything's a fucking tiger, you know, or a princess you're going to have sex with and stakes are so high and, and you're all in this heightened state. No, no, no. Just chill. Observe the ego. Send it love. Play the game when you want to. But be, you know, shift your point of identification to the observer. Absolutely key. And then the last thing is to observe the mind. You know, observe how your thoughts flow through your head. And this is something great that Sam Harris does. He actually has a guided meditation online um, that I'll try to put in the show notes. It's awesome. Um, talking about being the observer of your own thoughts and then finding the consciousness in the space in between the thoughts. Your thoughts are not you. We all have fucked up thoughts. You know, all of these religious ideas of you should be held accountable and punished for your thoughts. That's a really convenient way to make everybody guilty because everybody has fucked up thoughts. You know, let me just put that out there. Everybody has fucked up thoughts. I think Bertrand Russell was talking about a thought experiment where, you know, he imagined everybody could read everybody else's mind. And he said immediately when everybody could read everybody else's mind, they would be horrified and everybody would lock themselves indoors. They would not communicate with anybody. But eventually, after reading everybody else's mind and realizing that everybody was the same and that they were just like everybody, everybody had fucked up thoughts, life would go on and things would be normal. And I don't think we need to read people's minds to know that. Everybody has fucked up thoughts. It's part of you know, the combination of being in this time in existence where we have this savage body and we have this savage human and, and also the access to consciousness and also the mind and also the ego and all of these things swirling around. You're not your thoughts. It's all good. You're the consciousness, the observer behind the thoughts. It's enough to choose which actions to take. It's not about what actions you want to see or what actions you think. It's about what you do. That's what decides whether you're good or not. It's not about what you think. That's nonsense. So be the observer, both of body, of emotions, and of your thoughts. Cool. Number one. Probably you do that in 2017, you're going to fucking crush it. You're going to be so happy. You know, that's like a huge one, but there's more. Number two, and this was another, another big one. Focus on process, not outcome. And when, you know, when I was thinking about this, you know, you think we, we kind of understand this a little bit, but there's this whole culture around goals and everybody tries to sell you on the idea that if you achieve these goals, then you're going to be happy. Well, the problem is that the achieving of a goal is just a moment in time. So as soon as you achieve that goal, you have new goals. So then really what they're trying to say, if you break it down, is that you're never going to be happy because you're only happy when you achieve the goals. But as soon as you achieve the goal, you make a new goal. So when are you going to be happy? Never. That's the plan. Great plan. Love that plan. Not. Do not love that plan. <laughs> really, everything is a process. Like the process of achieving your goals is the goal, right? So instead of thinking about goals, you know, fuck goals. Think about your mission. Think about ultimately what you want to accomplish. The goals are just milestones along the way. And, and you know what? Most of the time when you achieve the goals, it doesn't even matter. You're not even thinking about that anymore. Really, it's all about the process. The process and the mission. What is your mission in life? What is your mission for 2017? What is the overwhelming, overarching thing that you are pointed towards? You know, what is the war you're trying to win? You know, and there'll be many goals along the way. And it's fine to say that. I'm not saying like don't have milestones or don't have markers you're shooting for. But don't stress about that. You know, know that the process is, is, is where the perfection is. You know, if you're trying to lose weight, you're not going to be happy when you've lost the weight. Be happy now in the process of losing weight. That's going to help you stick to your plan. That's going to help you stick to your goals. That's going to keep giving you the motivation and fire to continue because it's going to be pleasurable the whole way. You know, we're programmed to, to avoid pain and seek pleasure. You know, so if we don't do that, 
you know, and if we just say, oh, I'm going to get pleasure at this point when I achieve this, everything's a false summit. It's not real. You know, no matter what you think you want to achieve, you're never going to be happy. You know, it's like if you think that getting a new fancy car is going to make you happy, guess what? As soon as you get that car, you'll be happy for a minute and then you'll be looking at another car or you'll be looking at another thing. Be happy in the process of making the money towards getting that car and then enjoy the car and then enjoy that process and enjoy the next process. You know, be process oriented, not destination oriented. There is only one destination. That's death. We're all headed there. And that's not even a final destination. That's just a pit stop, you know, along the way. And we get this, you know, you talk to athletes, like you would think that every athlete, you know, if they were going to be goal oriented, their goal would be all they would be focusing on was winning the Super Bowl, right? Or winning the Stanley Cup or winning the NBA finals. But you listen to them in the playoffs. What does every single one of them say? I'm just taking it one game at a time, just taking it one play at a time, just taking it one game and one play at a time. Why? Because that's the only way they can be present and the only way they can perform is being present. You know, they have to remove that goal. You know, that becomes their mission, but they're not worried about that. They're just worried about the process. They're worried about what their f- footwork is doing, what their pl- next play that's being called. They're worried about being present. And that's what we need to be worried about too. You know, actually not worried about it, just be it. You know, just be present. And it's the same, you know, I remember I was reading through uh, some journals and, and you know there was a, it was one of my old Google Drives and I do a lot of my journaling some of it I do um, on paper and some of it I do in Google Drive because um, it's easier for me to search and sort and I was just looking through one of my old email accounts and, um, and uh, the post was titled A Dark Hour and clearly I was avoiding I was not abiding by uh, um, goal number one or, or lesson number one, not goal number one, lesson number one for, for 2017, which is to be the observer. I was just locked in my own emotional hell and wasn't able to access consciousness at this particular point. But I remember it must have been lasting long enough that I went out and I actually asked Tim Kennedy some advice. And, you know, I asked him like, man, how do you get through some of the toughest situations that you've ever had to get through? Because he's been in some shit, you know, not just in UFC and in the training room, but in war. It's like, how do you get through it? And what did he answer? Man, just one step at a time, one process, you know, clean the gun this way, move your feet this way, you know, point the, point the weapon this way, walk this way, you know, set your sights this way, do the things one step at a time, and that's all you can worry about. So no matter if you're in the best place or you're in the worst place, just focus on the process to get yourself out of it. You know, don't focus on the outcome. Like if you're super bummed out and in a super shitty mood, throwing the fucking most epic pity party of all pity parties, you know, if you if you think that you, you know, and all you're focusing on is the goal to be happy and you just you keep focusing on that goal to be happy and then you're you're just going to become increasingly disappointed you know, for every second that you're not accessing that happiness. So instead, you know, why not focus on the process to take you from your current state to a greater state of happiness? You know, that's what you need to be focusing on. And maybe that's changing the music. Maybe that's going to a workout. Maybe that's going floating or going to yoga or doing some meditation or, you know, hitting up one of your buddies. Maybe it's just the process that will take you out of this mood. Maybe it's the food that you're putting in your body. Maybe it's some supplements you can take, whatever. It doesn't matter. Focus on the process that's going to get you from here to there. And that's, that's the key. Number two, lesson number two, you know, process, not destination. Hashtag fuck goals. Um, sweet. Number three, play, play. Don't take it so seriously. You know, I mean, one of my favorite things to say is, you know, even life and death isn't life and death. And again, this comes back to my own metaphysical understanding of consciousness in that consciousness never dies. It's just a transition. Death is a transition to the non-physical dimension, a dimension that I've already feel like I've explored. And so if life and death isn't really life and death and it's just a transition, yeah, it would be a shame to die before you got to play all the and experience all the things you could in life. But it's not the end of the world. It's just a transition to the non-physical dimension. And probably 
most likely you'll get another shot at this physical dimension, you know? But regardless, whether that's there or whether that's not there, you're still going to reap the benefits from playing, enjoying your time. You know, you, you look at the top five deathbed regrets, and, and this was calculated by this woman, Bronnie Ware, who was in palliative, a palliative care nurse, working with people in nursing homes, and they all say, I wish I would have let myself be happier. That's number one. And we're happiest when we play, when we're light, when we, we lower the stakes. When we make everything life or death, the ego loves to make everything life or death. Your success in business, your success in romance, your success in this or that is life or death. What people are saying about you, the haters, the blah, blah, blah. It's all like life or death because you're, act, you're, you're being your ego. But it's all just play. It's all a game. It's all our controlled folly. Once we become the observer, you know, the controlled folly again is that Toltec concept of, you know, just play the game. Play it like it's the grandest video game ever but play, you know, and that's really absolutely the key, you know, and, and you look at how that affects performance. Like think about the greatest clutch performers, you know, like Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant and some of the most, the classic timeless images of those performers who always seem to hit the game winning shot was that wry little smile, that little smile that showed you that it was still a game. You know, and actually even, even in one of my friends, you know, TJ Dillashaw, when he was fighting Henan Burrell, you know, you could see there was, there was some play in his step. You know, he had belief and it was, you know, there's probably nothing more serious <laughs> we can play than MMA and an MMA title fight. But he had that bounce, that play, that little bit of that little smile that would creep in, you know, in certain exchanges. And you contrast that to when he was fighting Dominic Cruz and he was pissed. He was pissed at Dominic Cruz and he lost his play. You know, he lost that play that kept him light and kept him fast and kept him performing well. And that's why he lost that fight. And that's why I don't think he would lose that fight again. I think he recognizes where that boundary is, where you got to play, you got to be light enough, even when the stakes are as high as they can be for this world, you know. Have that smile, crack that joke. The worst thing you can do in an MMA locker room is make it all more serious than it is, you know? Play, relax, you know? That's why when, when Whitney, my partner, was going out for her very first fight, you know, we, we, we came up with the walkout song that she enjoyed dancing to the most. She does this full-on, like, exuberant, you know, outlandish dance to this one song, Imagination by Gorgon City. And that's the song that she walked out to. And, and her opponent walked out to some kind of hateful, I'll strangle you, blah, 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 shut your mouth, bitch. I don't know, some, something like that. It's actually a good song. But the difference is that Whitney was light and fluid because it was play. It was a game. And, and that's the key. You know, play, play 2017 like it's a game. You know, even when the stakes are high, remind yourself that it's a game. Because, as I said, even life and death isn't life and death. And there's one thing I wanted to do on this podcast. I've been working on a, <clears throat> a new genre um, of communication. And I got this from my friend NQ. His name's Adam. And he delivers this amazing spoken word. And, you know, I've always been a poet, but I've always been more of a written poet. And spoken word is a way to uh, translate poetry into a more performance art. Um, so a podcast isn't the best way to do it. And I'm certainly going to be doing it in person and doing it on video. Um, but I wanted to read it here as kind of the first look into, uh, into this and, and it pertains because, um, you know, the piece is called why, but, uh, but it's really, you know, about playing the game. So I am going to perform this for the first time ever in public. It's funny. I can give a speech in front of like hundreds, thousands of people. I can do a podcast that's going to reach a million, you know, and I don't get nervous, but whenever I read my own poetry, you know, I definitely, for some reason, um, you know, it brings a lot of stuff up. So uh, it's a great, it's kind of a cool feeling. It reminds me of, um, you know, when I was um, competing, you know, playing basketball or playing something else. It's, it's interesting. It's funny how, you know, when you, when you present your own works, um, it can be more challenging. So I can only imagine what it's like for a stand-up comedian, you know, who has to do that same thing. I mean, that's... Uh, that's I have mad respect for those individuals. But anyways, here we go. The piece is called Why. A kid asked me why. He didn't need to say more because in his eyes were alcohol, Adderall, thoughts of suicide. I looked at him and he was me playing a different life. 
So I answered him. Life is the best video game that we'll ever make. I mean, look around. You gotta admit, the graphics are insane. There are no controllers except for your brain. When your character gets hurt, you actually feel the pain. Not a single level is ever the same. And not only that, you get to have sex in this game. You don't ever have to play alone. We've got 8 billion people in a massive multiplayer, online, offline, in line at the grocery store. And that's just the people. There are plants and animals, vegetables and minerals, numerous, precious, delicious. Every game has rules. But no matter what parents, pastors, politicians tell you, there is only one rule. Make the game better for everyone. Every game has obstacles, boss battles. That's what makes it a game worth playing. So when, thunks, <clears throat> so when something comes up, inside, B-side, outside, it's just a chance to level up. The dragons make the heroes. The demons make the angels. Pressure makes the diamond. Iron sharpens iron. And this, right now, will make you. So you can swallow a barrel or too many pills, hit the reset button. But when you get back home where there is no pain, no struggle, no victory, no gain, you're going to miss this game. So you'll come back again to play another turn inside a new character that will never quite be you. Or maybe by the time you're ready to play again, this world won't be accepting any more plays. Life on Earth, archived by the memory of time like Sega Genesis from 89. Let me give you a cheat code to get you started. Forgive yourself mercifully. Love yourself ruthlessly. Protect the earth fiercely. Treat people identically. Cultivate community. Dance expressively. Have gratitude daily. Orgasm regularly. Forget your history and live presently. And if things get a little boring, take a few grams of mushrooms and howl at the fucking moon. Ow! So go ahead and play. Play pain, play work, play laugh so hard that tears well up, play fight so hard that knuckles swell up, play artist painting your masterpiece, play hero living your odyssey, or play absolutely nothing at all. However you want to, just play. This is a game you win over a lifetime, not a day. Well, that kind of sums it up, people. I love y'all. I know you're going to have a great year. I'm here to support you in any way I can. Thank you so much for your support. I love meeting you guys. I love all the positive feedback. And again, you know, if you guys could please leave a review if you enjoy the podcast, that'll help me a ton. And uh, let's keep this thing rolling. You know, let's have a beautiful year. Let's have a lot of fun. And uh, let's make the game better for everyone. Much love. Peace.